very interesting second webinar on wind engineering and wind loading last time we had a webinar on the codal provisions of 875 part 3 by the stalwart and expert in the field of wind engineering dr suresh kumar from rwdi vice president and we have another stalwart mr girish dravid director sterling engineering so i welcome both the stalwarts for this uh, webinar and regarding issc i would like to just brief you in few minutes issc has been formed in 1997 by our great uh, mr rajendra nene and from interesting and since then we are conducting so many technical programs lectures seminars workshops for the fraternity of civil engineering initially it was started by structural engineers but later on we are accommodating and we are inviting all the civil engineers for this uh, association and of course i welcome all of you to this today's webinar and i appeal to all the civil engineers to please become our members if you are not member of issc to stand up our hands issc is taking up various challenges faced by civil engineers and especially by structural engineers right from the documentation to the certification format any justice speak to the faculty members also issc is raising the voice for the member and civil engineers especially we also have the quarterly publications wherein we publish the quarterly journals with good technical articles and case studies Uh, shared by our fraternity members and senior or structural engineers then we have our website where we have lot of technical references available on the website so you can of course refer to our website we intimate our way incoming uh, future events also through our website and email to all our members and it is basically a platform for knowledge sharing we try to disseminate the knowledge that is very important So we have to keep learning all the days. So that is the motto, and with this, we are all the time conducting various uh, other programs as well. And our dynamic president, Mr. Chandigarh Jain, he is not able to attend today because of uh, ill health. But he is inspiring all the team ISSC members to do such nice uh, workshops and programs. Now another uh, task I have. Do is I have to introduce the speaker. Today's speaker, Mr. Girish David. Girish David is a well-known figure, uh, but in a few words, I would like to just tell you about Mr. Girish David. Girish David is completed his civil engineering graduation and structural engineering post graduation from Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. Currently, he is a director of one of the most prominent structural engineering firms in India. Sterling Engineering Consultancy Services Private Limited. In his career of uh, 37 years, he has led design teams to come up with innovative structural schemes and designs of diverse projects that include tall residential buildings, commercial complexes, hotel, retail, malls, convention centers, office buildings, industrial structures, sport complexes, hospitals, railway stations, and variety of other buildings. Situated in major cities all over India and other countries as well, this structural design bears a mark of innovation and are based on the principle of constructability, which is I think very important, and structural aesthetics as well. He is known for conducting optimized design studies as a routine on each of the projects that he is involved with, and he promotes techniques of sustainable structural design. He is also responsible for many high-rise buildings in India. That include the prestigious 320 meter tall Palais Royal at Mumbai, more than 25 buildings with height more than 200 meters, 8 million square feet of Dhirubhai Ambani International Convention Center, built in RCC and Structural Steel, and with a very large office building for the ICICI Bank in Hyderabad, which has consumed more than 35,000 metric tons of structural steel. King Fish Tower is a recently completed iconic project in Bangalore. Mr. Giriraj David is the India representative of Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which is again a worldwide organization that connects all professionals connected with planning, designing, constructing, maintaining, and 
in all aspects of uh, living in tall buildings across 56 countries and it encourages research studies and surveys debates discussions dissemination of information education and act as a world official arbitrator of measuring heights of the buildings under various categories so i welcome mr girish david uh, for this event he will be the moderator for the event and of course i welcome uh, world renowned expert in build, build engineering and winter studies dr k suresh kumar uh, vice president rwdi now i will request uh, girish david to go ahead and introduce our today speaker uh thank you hemant am i audible yes yep okay uh, so uh, really speaking uh, after that long introduction of mine which was not really required i am not the uh, celebrity speaker today it's suresh who actually also does not need an introduction to indian audience he has been you know stalwart wind engineer uh, for uh, a very long time and he has been a pioneer in introducing wind tunnel uh, test uh, procedures uh, in india i remember uh, long back when uh, we were only dreaming of uh, utilizing uh, wind tunnel facilities uh, anywhere in the world and we were in nascent stages of uh, uh, de development of tall buildings in india uh, it just happened that suresh came to india and introduced this wind tunnel testing uh, to us and we were we were so happy and blessed and since then we have been utilizing his services uh, uh, for a very long time uh, rwdi is a world renowned uh, organization uh, not only in wind tunnel testing but also in climate studies and environmental studies a uh, lot of uh, research is being done there uh, suresh is heading rwdi india and of course uh, without further uh, uh, In, uh, any any uh, more introduction uh, i will i'll just put my hands uh, into the uh, topic of today and uh, suresh uh, our code is 875 part 3 wind code uh, we are quite um, uh, used to using this k1 k2 k3 and k4 factor nowadays as well and uh, uh there is terrain height and topography and the cyclonic regions and all that all these more or less deal with the velocity wind velocity and uh, uh we are uh, we quite very well know how to uh, uh, i mean we have the confidence of uh, using the wind tunnel test results uh, uh which give us the forces on our structure uh, and uh, we have been doing it uh, we can correlate we can uh, ask you questions uh, why is this so and why wind tunnel forces are different from the chordal forces and you have been explaining uh, so many things which pertain more or less to the velocity the there is another factor in the code that is kd wind directionality and this is where a lot of questions uh, do arise in mind and whether uh, without using the wind tunnel uh, results are we really looking at uh, the appropriate uh, forces uh, using the chordal values uh, code gives a 0.9 factor i mean are we really justified in reducing the wind forces uh, without knowing the uh, effect of directionality uh, or what i mean it's all vague and uh, uh, more light needs to be thrown on this now this topic the integration of wind tunnel data with full scale wind climate i believe you also intend to include the directionality in this uh, study so is that true yes it is and 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 this whole talk is about only wind directionality fantastic so i think you can start with your thoughts and uh, um, as you go along i will keep questioning you on other aspects as well okay that's good yeah all to right. yeah okay all right girish uh, thanks uh, thanks for your kind introduction and uh, uh, first of all i need to thank to uh, issc for agreeing to conduct this uh, uh, webinar 
as well as all the participants who are um, uh, right here listening. Uh, and also to Girish, of course, I mean, he agreed to moderate this particular session as well. And my whole team, I mean, there is a number of people behind this webinar in arranging, so I wanted to thank them as well. So let us start. I mean, uh, RWDI is, I think, a nice introduction is already given by Girish and uh, Hemant already. And uh, these are some of RWDI's key experiences. So I think the structures will talk by itself. So we have done some of the longest bridges in the world. We have also done uh, some of the tallest buildings in the world and still some of them are under construction. So I won't get into any of these details and most of you already know. So I'll just uh, go on to the outline. Sorry, not the outline, the perception of this talk. Because I typically show outline uh, first, but this time I thought I'll put the perception first before the outline. Um, first of all, wind climate. When we talk about wind climate, uh, we have two components, wind speed and wind direction. So like I said earlier mentioned, wind directionality is the main part that we are going to be discussing, not too much on wind speed. I will just uh, talk some of the basics on wind speed, then I'll turn on to uh, wind direction. And uh, the basic question is, how do we take care of this wind directionality? Uh, this is not a well understood item. And uh, even the codes are not very um, clear on these things. So we will be talking a bit on the codes as well. There are lots of confusion among practitioners uh, that which Arlui Grish mentioned about that. And, and more confusion in the industry by some consultants uh, saying that we can reduce loads and we can increase loads and things like that, which is sometimes it's a cheap uh, way of uh, doing consulting. And uh, then uh, let us see how we can uh, take care of this wind directionality. So here, uh, optimization, I think we need to as consultants as well as, as developers and structural engineers, everybody is after optimizing the structure. Uh, we want to have a sustainable solution and an economical solution. We all agree to that. I mean, we want to be optimizing the structural system as well as cladding systems. Uh, but a priority must be given to the robustness of the procedures while integrating with the internal data or while taking care of the wind directionality. We have to be very careful. I mean, we should not be on a race with optimizing. And uh, of course, we can be on a race with optimizing the structure, but we need to also uh, give probably the primary importance to the robustness of the procedures that we are using, because otherwise you lose track with the accuracy of the method that you are using. Uh, but I don't want to frighten you with all of these terms. And I just want to say that ultimately, uh, when you do internal tests, uh, it will fall onto the wind consultant's responsibility to take care of this. Uh, not really, we are not pushing back to the structural engineers or the developers to take care of this. It's basically the responsibility of the wind consultants. They are supposed to be picking the right method for integrating the wind tunnel data with the wind direction. So that I need to underline on that fact because as you go further down in, the, in this presentation, you will realize that how complicated things are actually. So uh, we have uh, ways of taking care of that uh, complexity in our analysis procedures, which I'll be explaining in a layman's term. I don't get into too much into the details with the mathematics. Suresh, can I interrupt? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, when you say that uh, the uh, wind consultant has to take the responsibility yes. uh, of uh, guiding the structural consultants, yes. Uh, that also implies that the results that you obtain from the wind tunnel test, you have to correlate yes. with some kind of data. Yes. And yes. Uh, do you do you affirm that you have this data, uh, yeah. uh, you know, seasonal or over, yes. over some years yes. that you will compare and then will you will advise the structural consultants to orient, reorient the buildings? Okay, that that is very well possible. 
very well possible and that's exactly what we have done in certain projects and the most famous one is uh, Burj Khalifa. So in Burj Khalifa, we have reoriented the structure which is coming in, in one of my transparency, one of my slides later. Okay. Uh, we have reoriented by 35 to 40 degrees and we could uh, save a lot by reorienting it. And likewise, okay. we can do in any, any building. Uh, the only issue is that, okay, Burj Khalifa, it, it happened to be at that time, there's lots of space and we can rotate it, rotate the structure. Right. But in many cases, uh, for instance, in Mumbai, we don't have the space. So probably right. you're stuck with the plot and yeah. uh, you won't be able to reorient. But at least those information is very useful because you will come to know whether this particular axis should be the weakest axis or the strongest axis so that you won't penalize the structure. You know? So those That's aspects you will come to know uh, very early on. And so that you can accordingly plan your structure. So basically, you have the data yes, uh, yes, to yes. compare. Okay. Yes, fine. yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Uh, the outline is uh, just an introduction, and uh, then immediately getting into the standards. Uh, what the standards speak on uh, bin directionality. Then a bit on a brief on wind tunnel studies, because how the wind tunnel studies are done and where this wind directionality comes into picture. And that is then the fourth part, which is the directionality integration techniques, which is out there. And just to compare against each other, one versus the other, how good they are. And then finally with conclusions. So like I said, this is a bit a heavy topic, a bit heavy. Uh, so I want you to pay attention to uh, each of the details that I'm going to be discussing. So uh, just an introduction. So this is the famous Allen J. Davenport's wind loading chain. And without this, we won't be starting with uh, any, uh, any discussion on wind loading, actually. It's a beautiful uh, conception chain. Where you can see wind climate, there are links, influence of terrain, aerodynamic effects, dynamic effects, criteria. These are the five links. And uh, this constitutes, and this will help you to figure out your wind load on any structure, not just uh, buildings. It can be bridges, it can be stadiums, it can be anything. So from where do you get the wind climate? Wind climate, you're going to get it from full-scale wind climate data. Right. I think in Mumbai, you'll get it from Mumbai airport, or even Kolaba station has uh, some data. And we can combine the data. We can check one, one uh, uh, data against another data from the same city. Uh, so all of those opportunities are there. Um, so this full scale wind climate data basically uh, by some researchers did their own analysis and came up with speeds. And those speeds are in the code, okay? The, the code has a basic wind speed map, any code you take, I mean, whether Indian code or any other code for that country, there's a basic wind speed map and that basic wind speed map is relying on the full scale wind climate data from the airports, from the stations and et cetera. So please remember that this is all basically a bunch of analysis which is done and then these numbers are found out and then we put it in the code for users to use it with some particular risk level. As you know, wind is not constant. Wind is a, a kind of a random force so we have to associate that with some risk, uh, risk levels and accidents and et cetera. So for instance, in Mumbai, we say 50 return period speed is 44 meter per second is the accidents of 50 return period is 2% in any given year is 44 meter per second. Likewise, in every country has their own accidents. I mean, most of the time the accidents limits are 50 year return period or if you are in ultimate state, then you may get into 1,000 year return period or 1,700 year return period and all of those things, which I don't want to get into. That is not the part that I want to be discussing here. Then the other part, the other four links you combine that you can get from wind tunnel tests or from standard again. Uh, from standard, any standard that you use, you will get a part of this from the standard. But that will be very limited information, not 
uh, very detailed information like what a internal can provide you. Because as you know, uh, the last one, the diagram, local wind flow effects, you have wake turbulence, you have self-induced turbulence and motion-induced turbulence. In my last uh, talk with the code, I explained all of these things. And all of these stuff, which I'm talking about local wind flow effects, you can get it from winter, but you can't get it from cold because the reason is wake turbulence is wake uh, interaction between another building. So that is surrounding buildings are required to find out wake turbulence and uh, wake, uh, wake induced effects, which none of the codes explain that, which is impossible if you think about it, because every, every place even in Mumbai is different in terms of wake effects. And self-induced turbulence means that the building shape itself is causing some turbulence because as you know, codes are more representing boxy type buildings like a square or rectangle or a triangle or something like that. Not like buildings with setbacks, buildings with balconies, building with fins, et cetera, et cetera. So those uh, have a huge effect on your response. So that is self-induced turbulence that you won't get it out of the code. You need to do a internal test. Motion-induced turbulence, you'll get part of it from the code. That is your gas factor. Because Absolutely. as you know, you, you apply a gas factor approach, you have a gas factor and that, that gas factor depends on your uh, structural frequencies, mold shapes, et cetera, et cetera. So those are motion induced turbulence. Uh, so in a nutshell, we never talked anything about wind directionality here. Nothing, nowhere I mentioned about wind directionality and that is supposed to come, which uh, we'll take it further later on. So from where do you get the wind climate data sources? Wind climate data means wind speed as well as direction. It is not just about the speed. So you can get it from airports, dedicated stations, or you can get it from some modeling. Uh, for instance, weather research forecasting models you can utilize uh, to get extreme wind speeds in, in non-cyclonic systems like thunderstorms, monsoons, and uh, how do you do that is you have upper atmospheric data, which you can purchase satellite or measuring upper atmospheric data and course grid throughout the world. Anywhere you want, you can get that data. And then you can use the weather research forecasting models to predict what is going to happen at the bottom and where the structures are existing. So this is a possibility we have been utilizing this heavily uh, in places where you don't have proper airport data or you have less airport data. For instance, in certain cases, you have only 10 years of data, airport data, but 10 years of data is not uh, sufficient enough to predict a 50 year return delete speed. You need at least 25 to 30 year data to predict a 50 year return delete speed. So that is the issue. Right. In those places, you can bring in this uh, tool and you can uh, utilize that data. Or the last one is the Monte Carlo simulation, which is quite famous uh, for getting cyclonic data. Uh, because many codes depends on Monte Carlo simulation uh, for cyclonic data, because you won't, have, you won't be having proper measurement during cyclones. Uh, many uh, airport stations are not going to work during severe cyclones. So you don't have a proper data and you don't know when the landfall happens and when the cyclone passed, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the best thing to do is these tracks, as well as the, uh, the, the uh, lateral motions and the rotational motion of the cyclones have been already uh, recorded. And you can utilize this and use Monte Carlo simulation. In, you can simulate these storms, n number of storms. You can simulate 100,000 storms, 50,000 storms. Uh, and then you can pick the data out of that and you can utilize that. This is a very known technique. None of these are not anything new. I would say Monte Carlo is there for a long time. And NCDC WRF is, uh, you can say probably in the last decade, it uh, is being widely started using it. Uh, wind speed influence, uh, local loads to the order of V square and uh, structural loads to the order of V square to V cube. Uh, so if you make an error in 10% error in your speed, in either way, you, you're going to be penalizing your structure. 
Yeah. But fortunately, fortunately, we are not going to hear in the in the lower range actually. <laughs> Yeah. Most of the codes are wearing on the higher range. So because of that, your loads could be uh, really conservative. So, yeah, which we uh, discussed in your last yes. seminar. Yeah. Correct, yeah. correct. So I just want to really bring that into picture again, just one okay. more time before I get into wind direction. This is not the part I'll be discussing in detail. Right. Some of the challenges we are facing are liability of existing data. Uh, you will always get data, but you need to be you need to be very sure about where this has been measured, what is the height at which the data has been measured, what is the averaging time. Uh, this is a very significant, <coughs> sorry, very significant issue on this. Because I know cases where the, the anemometer has been moved over the period of time and when we get the data, we realize oh, the data was moving like this, then all of a sudden it dropped and it is moving somewhere else. And then we contacted back and found out that the anemometer location has been changed, which there is no record of that uh, along with the data. Right. And averaging time is another interesting thing. Because as mm. far as wind engineering is concerned, if you don't know, if you just uh, tell a speed, let us say well, this is 45 meter per second, uh, but uh, we are waiting for the averaging time. At what averaging time is this measurement yep. happen? whether it is three seconds, in hourly, 10 minutes, et cetera. Without that information, that number has no value, no value in wind engineering, okay? So mm -hmm. we need to know what is the averaging time. Mm -hmm. And extraneous data, outliers, all the time you'll have some outliers due to instrumentation issues or some other issues. So you need to be at times looking at uh, pressure data and temperature data to comprehend whether your wind speed data is meaningful or not. Because uh, you may have some good pressure measurements as well as temperature measurements along with the wind measurements. And sometimes when we see an outlier, we go back and check the pressure measurements, whether it is making any sense at all. And then corrections required on upwind fetch on anemometer, because for instance, the, the anemometer could be in a, in a terrain which is surrounded by buildings. And so uh, the speed the anemometer is measuring is not really open terrain category speed. It is some kind of mixed terrain category speed. So you need to do some corrections in order to predict the uh, speed at the open terrain category. Uh, uh, and then mix of wind climate data sources in is another issue. Sometimes you have thunderstorms, cyclones, monsoons, and you can fit it with the different uh, uh, techniques, you can see on the right side, I have a graph where the blue lines at a low uh, slope, then all of a sudden it is taking off. So what that shows is maybe the low line is a monsoon and the top line is a cyclone or a thunderstorm. So you can have totally different slopes in your, in your data sets. Now just a few uh, shots about the speed versus what has been uh, analyzed. For instance, in Mumbai, the green dot uh, from the code versus the blue line from the actual data. And then in Calcutta, uh, you can see the IS-875 wind speed versus what is being predicted using extra tropical as well as cyclones. So most of the cases, the, the code speed seem to be a little higher, but uh, we are not alone on this. Uh, many other location does the same. I mean, Dubai has a higher speed as well. And uh, this, uh, this is still under discussion. Hong Kong, you can see very close to the predictions, but it is slightly higher than the predictions. Um, so th this conservatism is there in, uh, in other codes as well. Now I slowly move on to, I leave the wind speed because that is not our uh, primary intent here is on wind directionality. And I am showing Mumbai, Dubai, Hong Kong. Uh, in Mumbai, the dominant winds coming from Southwest, in Dubai from, uh, you can see uh, West. west. Yeah. Yeah. And then in Hong Kong, it's mostly cyclonic systems. So it can come from anywhere. So that means it's more circular climate, more circular right. climate. Uh, so the wind speed with a particular risk level is not constant from all direction. This is something we need to be learning. Because in Mumbai, when we say 44 meter per second, 
and uh, the, the, the risk is one by 50. That means 2% of accidents is 44 meter per second. But that 2% accidents, 44 meter per second is only happening from the Southwest. It is not happening from other regions. If you look at, uh, let us say East, it is only, uh, you can say 25 or something. That the same accidents is only 25. So if you want a 50 year accidents at that location, the speed uh, is something else, okay? So this is something very important. So the speed is not constant from all directions. So any city that you take, that is what is happening. But typically the code addresses address that this is your basic wind speed uh, velocity. And it wouldn't really tell that this velocity, what is the chance of this velocity going to happen from all directions? Okay, Suresh, one question. Just uh, for the benefit of the viewers, yes. uh, this particular uh, wind directionality graph is for 50-year yes. return period? This is for 50-year return period, yes. And uh, this is based on um, the actual observation? Actual data, various, yes. Uh, actual data. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The only thing is, this is not the way exactly it is going to get applied uh, to the wind tunnel data and etc., which is a different, altogether a different issue. But yeah. when you analyze it, this is what is you are going to get. You can That's see right. that uh, for 44 meter per second, if it has to happen from the east, your return period is going to be very high. Yes. Understand, your return period is going to be very high. Yes. Okay. So here, what we are trying to address later on, okay, what is the big deal of having different wind speed from different direction? is you have a building or any type of structure which is also aerodynamically sensitive, right? So if let us say I have a building aerodynamically very sensitive from, uh, from one of the axes, it is very sensitive. Then if I get a chance to rotate my building, not to point in the Southwest direction, because that is my weakest axis. I don't want to put my weakest axis towards the Southwest direction. I can point my weakest axis to probably a northwest direction or something so that my wind speed is low, right? And that is Suresh, a Suresh, Suresh, yes. you have to repeat the uh, last two sentences. We lost you. Oh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the building, let us say I'm assuming a building and that building has a weakest axis, weakest axis. Yeah. Because any building may have weakest axis axis as well as strongest axis. And I can point my strongest axis to the Southwest direction right. because I'm getting maximum speed. Okay, fine. But that is my strongest uh, axis. So it can uh, have that load, but I don't want to point my weakest uh, direction to that uh, particular direction. That's right. So, so that is where the misalignment of aerodynamically and climatically important wind directions you know, can reduce the load. That is the sentence which address this particular stuff. Right. So which will really help in any studies and try to orient, reorient the structure, we have a chance. Hmm. So wind directionality technique is used to merge the aerodynamic data with the climate data. So here, um, instead of uh, discussing too much, I thought I'll bring an example so that everybody can see how uh, how dominant these effects are. For instance, I picked an Indian uh, basic wind speed map. I circled two spaces here. I mean, one is Mumbai, other one is Hyderabad. And both of these locations are uh, 44 meter per second, the same velocity at both locations. But Mumbai dominant winds are from Southwest and in Hyderabad dominant winds are from West. Okay, so let us see how this will have an impact on a building. I brought a building and this building, uh, you can see it's a more of a kind of a rectangle with a 35 by 35, uh, um, the sides uh, dimension, height is 250 meters. And then you can see there is a severe crosswind happening because these are base overturning moment coefficient and plotting. And you have the middle one is mean and uh, you have top one is maximum and bottom one is minimum. You can see wherever your mean is zero, you're getting a spike. That means that is your crosswind. So here you, you have a long wind and crosswind, a long wind and crosswind on both directions. 
Okay. So I applied the Mumbai data, uh, Mumbai Southwest. I picked up certain uh, direction. You can see on the side, in direction 100, 210, 280. Why did I pick those directions? Is because in those direction, I am getting my coefficient maximum. In 100, I'm getting 1.61. At 210, I'm getting 103. At 280, I'm getting 1.56. Right out of these graphs, you don't have to write down any of these things because you are going to be seeing this again um, in a LinkedIn page or something. So at that time, you can invest more time onto these. And here, you can see wind direction. For those wind direction, what is the speed? I'm picking out of this graph, whatever I'm showing. So at 100, my speed is only 25. At 210, my speed is 44. At 280, my speed is 30. Mm. Then I have my equation right here, m theta. I'm calculating my, which is the base bending moment that uh, uh, acts is uh, x, sorry, y. So then you can compute this half rho v square a into h into c. I'm very easy calculation. You can do it yourself later. And I'm pointing some green and red lines showing that these are the highest value on this building in Mumbai. For instance, uh, for MY, you are getting 2.62 10 over 9. And for MX, you are getting 6 10 over 9 in Mumbai, based on this wind directionality. So then the, the question is, if you go to Hyderabad, are you going to get the same? No. Because in Hyderabad, the wind directionality is different. So I'm getting into Hyderabad right now. I picked the same direction again, 100, 210, 280, 10, 190, 240, with the corresponding wind speed out of this graph, with the CMs, which I quoted earlier, and then I'm computing my moment. Then I'm getting a totally different result. So just imagine, you have the same speed, you have the same building, same axis, same structural system, and same uh, terrain conditions. I am assuming the terrain condition to be the same, but my building has different values at different cities, right? right? So this is the impact of wind directionality because nothing else is involved here. Nothing else, yeah. everything is same. Everything else is same. Even the wind, wind data coming out of the tunnel is also the same, whether you are doing it in Hyderabad, a project, or in Mumbai. It is supposed to be the same as far as the, the properties are the same, right? Suresh, if yes. we uh, take this analogy uh, instead of from Mumbai to Hyderabad, let us yes. talk of Hyderabad to Mumbai, okay? So uh -huh. we designed a building in Hyderabad yes. and then take it to Mumbai in the same with the same uh, directionality of the building, not not building. of the wind. Yes. Now I have a very serious question to ask. Yeah. See the code in the code, the directionality factor KD has been uh, uh, prescribed as 0.9. Yes. It, it doesn't say 1.1. 1 .1. Uh -huh. it, it is only asking you to reduce the load. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, in some cases, the loads may increase. Uh, no, it won't no. increase. No, it won't increase because it will only reduce because you are combining your maximum, because from the wind tunnel, you are having the maximum speed yes. which you are using initially from all direction, right? Correct. From Correct. all direction, you are uh, using the maximum speed and then you are combining with the worst responses. Uh, the non-dimensional responses from the wind tunnel for all direction. Right. So you can't exceed that. You know, one of those values cannot be understood. Exceeded. Perfect. But but point nine is also um, an assumption which can yes. which can be quite conservative. Correct. Uh, that is true. That is yeah. true because we have cases where you can go as low as uh, probably you can say thirty-five thousand foot. Is it okay. possible? Yeah. Okay. It's Fine. Yeah. Right. Clear. Because uh, in the co codal situation, we can, uh, I mean, there are restrictions as to how far one can go. Okay. Of course. Of can reduce course. it. Yeah. Uh, likewise, in bridges, for instance, I want to bring the bridge into picture as well. Let us say you have a bridge alignment, you have a bridge aligned in this way. And when we analyze the directionality, you can see that these graphs are saying that the wind is dominant from 310, 300 degrees. But the perpendicular direction to the bridge is the most important direction as far as aerodynamics is concerned. 
and you are not going to get maximum speed perpendicular to the bridge. And this is a very, very important information as far as design of bridge is concerned. Because let us say this bridge is in uh, Mumbai, for instance, and our directionality is not this, it is coming from southwest from 210, 210, 210 to 20 degrees. Still it is at an angle. And we don't have to design that bridge for that particular velocity. We can reduce the speed. So this has serious consequences on design and one has to look at that very seriously. So that is why I'm saying wind directionality is, uh, has a, is a great influence in design of uh, structures for wind. So let us go through quickly on the standards because I'm um, uh, slightly delayed on my talk, I believe. So KD factor, like Grish brought this a uh, number of times already in IS-875 as a 0.9 factor. And, uh, and we put uh, certain clauses to, I mean, 0.9 factor, that means 10% reduction is possible when you calculate loading on your building, uh, like a long wind load, cross wind load, you can apply 10% reduction. And this is uh, reasonable and probably on the conservative side and reasonable number, I can say, uh, because I don't think you don't have to worry like, okay, what if it is 0.95? Uh, I can assure you that uh, this number is already uh, on the conservative side. We don't have to worry too much on the 10% reduction. But for circular forms and cyclonic affected areas and local pressures, we have written very clearly that you had to use KD of one. That means no reduction. And uh, my personal opinion in this case is that based on my experience, this is too conservative. You can still get a reduction, even if you are in a cyclonic area, minimum five to 10%, you can still get it. Okay, so we need to, uh, we need to uh, amend this later on on this particular factor. This is, an, and also why for local pressures it is one. We can still reduce it. You can go back to 0.9 or even lower than that if you are comfortable. So I think this is something for uh, uh, to think about in the future uh, when we amend our code. So what the AC16 is using, which I think most of you already know, 15%. They are using 15% reduction, 0.85 factor. Okay. And uh, even for chimney circular structures, they are also suggesting some reductions. And they do suggest reductions for components and cladding as well. It is not just for uh, primary uh, main wind force or assisting systems. So there is nothing to worry about. This code is existing. This particular, uh, uh, the provision is existing for a long time. This has been widely used. And uh, we find it very useful information in that code. And uh, we shall be thinking along these lines, in my opinion. Australian code is, uh, has taken a much bolder step, I, mean, I believe, because they have in, uh, the, the uh, wind directionality factor on speed that is not on pressure, it is on speed. And you can see, depending on the region, your directionality factor changes. So this is one of the complications. If you want to bring directionality factor based on uh, directions, based on city, you, you can bring it. But then that is going to be like uh, too much variation across India. I mean, in, in West will be very different from the East and middle of India and et cetera. You can bring in such a graph in our code as well. It is possible. Uh, but here, uh, such a nice uh, uh, table where uh, they have taken much bolder step. You can see 0.8 factors they have. 0.8 means in pressures, it is going to be 0.8 square. So that means you can reduce already 35%, you know, 35% reduction on your loading uh, when the, 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 uh, the wind is happening from those directions, okay? So one can uh, drill into that, I mean, further deep in, dive deep into this and bring in uh, tables like this, it is possible, but you need the proper data. So I don't uh, get into that uh, right now. So now wind tunnel studies, I just want to brush it through very quickly because we have addressed already the code. Now we have to see, okay, at uh, what place in the wind tunnel studies we include uh, this wind directionality. 
So in wind tunnel simulations, you know, this is uh, a wind tunnel is being shown. We are uh, basically compressing the atmosphere. Uh, that means you have uh, the whole atmosphere in terms of uh, uh, is being compressed and the uh, turbulence and etc. should be simulated inside the tunnel. You have spires, you have roughness blocks to create the roughness so that you can have a bundle layer. You can have bundle layer profiles of uh, wind speed and uh, as well as uh, turbulence. Um, here, some of the similarity theory have to be followed. Kinematic similarity, geometric similarity, and dynamic similarity. I'm not getting into the details. That is a fundamental to any wind tunnel simulation. And uh, that is not uh, part of the discussion here, but I just want to uh, show it here. LBT scaling laws is a very common again, because you need to be scaling length, velocity, time. So length is typically in the wind tunnel, one is to 200, one is to 500. And typical velocity scales are uh, three to five in cladding studies and force balance is five to 10. That means your prototype velocity has been reduced in the winter uh, with respect to this particular number. So your prototype could be five times, sorry, your winter could be five times lower than, uh, you know, a lower velocity which should be blown in the winter. Time scale similar way, I mean, 80 to 130 in cladding studies and force balance uh, typically 30 to 80. That means whatever you measure in the uh, full scale for one hour is going to be few seconds in the winter. You don't have to do one hour test in the winter. Uh, just in a pictorial fashion, I'm showing uh, Bush Khalifa 826 meters. At one is to 50 scale, it comes down to 1.65 meters in the winter. Velocity 150 kilometer per hour looks like this in the full scale, uh, but at a scale of uh, five, it comes down to 30 kilometers per hour in the wind run. So you are compressing this velocity in the vertical direction, you are compressing. Your turbulence remains the same, but you are compressing the velocity. And in time, look at this, duration in the full scale is uh, 3,600 seconds. In the wind run, it could be only 36 seconds. So you are compressing in the horizontal direction. So you're compressing velocity in the vertical direction, time in the horizontal direction, geometry in all directions, basically, because the geometry is supposed to be, every single detail is supposed to be following that particular scale. And then when you predict everything in the, you, you measure everything in the wind tunnel, you can predict it back to full scale using these simple equations. These are all Beckingham Pike theorem. Uh, you can follow uh, non-dimensional uh, theorems, half rho v square, a p, g, c, d. Uh, this, is a, this is like a q rough multiplied with the area, multiplied with the guess factor, multiplied with the uh, force coefficient, which is a drag coefficient here. Similarly, in model scale, the same, but you can cut down g, c, d, a, uh, not a, sorry, rho, and then you'll finally come up with this number. That means, what this means is basically whatever you measure the shear force, in the wind tunnel, you can multiply with the VP by VM, the whole square, in the LP by LM, the whole square, you go back to prototype. It is as simple as that. So you have to basically make sure that the wind tunnel simulation is correct, whatever you measure, then finally you scale it back to prototype. Bending moment, similar way. Only thing is you have another uh, length factor comes yeah. into picture because of your right. uh, moment arm. So basically what this means is in full scale, maximum speed, geometry effects, uh, upstream terrain effects, local flow effects, the wake induced interference, body induced effects, inertial effects, everything is included. Everything is included, including the full scale maximum speed. And that is what this is doing, VP. VP is nothing but the full scale speed, right? So we have done everything. Uh, right out of these equations, the only thing we didn't do is the wind directionality effects. Uh, that is left out. That should be accounted analytically. Because in the wind tunnel, you don't think about from where the wind is coming from. You test every 10 degree angle of attack, 10 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree, like a, a religious way, you have to test all around 360 degree, you get all your data, you convert it back to your full scale data, with the every same speed. 
Yeah. With the, with with, the, same with the full scale speed. speed. With the yeah. full scale speed. Yeah. Uh, with the full scale maximum speed, you convert it back to your uh, prototype values. For every 10 degree angle of attack, you have a prototype value for, with the maximum speed 10 degree, 20 degree, like that. Whether it is a shear force or a movement or a torsion or any pressure coefficient, uh, sorry, pressure, uh, cladding pressures, everything you will come to know. Uh, in full scale. Now we come back to the integration techniques. This is the only thing left out, like I said. We have done everything except the wind directionality. How do we take care of this directionality? There are various uh, methods available and uh, which, ha which has been published and uh, written a number of papers as well. Uh, each method basically results in an effective directionality factor. Uh, more like a code. I mean, you can eventually find an effective directionality factor if you want. And non-directional is not a real method. I mean, this presumes that basically design wind speed will come from any direction with equal probability. That is what I just said. Because in the wind tunnel, when you convert your wind tunnel data to prototype, at that time, you don't think about from where the wind is coming from. We just apply the maximum speed, whatever the code is dictating, and then find out the responses for each one of those angles. What is the maximum response from each one of those angles? And that is non-directional. If, if you want, you can stop right there and pick the right, the, the maximum out of all the direction and you can design it. But that is not going to be an optimum design for sure because you didn't apply your wind directionality. That is where these methods come into picture. One of the methods is sector velocity method, typically called sector approach, sector approach in, in the literature. So uh, I will explain that approach later. Sectors are typically 22.5 to 45 degrees. And there is another mother called explicit method, storm passage. Sometimes it is called time history method. There are various names out there. Sometimes people call it direct method, which is a the direct, uh, as the name says, it's a direct method, which I'll be explaining later. Then the last one is a crossing method, combined probabilistic model of wind climate and structural response, uh, which will predict the design response directly and explicitly. This looks very abstract right now, so I don't want to uh, explain that right now, so I'll leave it for later. What is sector mother? A few equations I have to show. Uh, basically, you are dividing your sec dividing your wind climate into sectors. That means I am showing a sector here. This is my north sector. So I have a delta theta i. So I am going probably 22.5 degree in either way. Okay. So this is a kind of a 45 degree sector. And that is, then I'm cutting my MOI, for instance, this is my MOI plot from the wind tunnel. So the MOI plot from wind tunnel has all the responses at every 10 degree angle of attack. So I split this into 45 degree uh, sectors. So at each of the 45 degree sector, I can pick a maximum response from that 45 degree. For instance, this particular sector between 70 to 110 or whatever, slightly uh, 45 degree sector, I have some of the peaks happening. So even though some of the lows are also happening in that sector, but I won't be considering that. I'll be considering only the peak response from that sector. Then I'm combining with what is the uh, 50 or return period speed happening from that sector. I have to combine with that. For instance, this particular equation, half row, uh, you design the delta theta i, right? That is the delta theta i, you design speed from that delta theta i. That I have to combine with the maximum response from that particular sector. And likewise, I will do each sector. And I will do the same procedure. I will get, uh, in this particular case, I will get eight particular response of MY, eight particular response of MX, et cetera, and et cetera. And then I'll pick the peak out of that eight response. Okay. And that will be utilized for uh, design. So here there are 
yeah, certain other equations are also written because when you divide the sectors into pieces, you might not reach the maximum 50 or design speed. There is a likelihood that you may miss that. So if you miss that, then you had to renormalize your speed. That is why you, uh, 0 0.2 means this is your 50 year design speed. Then you had to go through this equation and then you renormalize your speed and then utilize that speed for your, uh, this particular equation to calculate your response. This is in detail. I mean, you can think about this. It's a very easy equation. There's nothing complicated here but you had to put your thoughts into it. You have to uh, cut it into pieces and then you have to take maximum response from each sector, your design wind speed also from that sector, then combine the two to get your response. Uh, just right. a summary procedure. Yeah. It uses basically extreme value distribution. That means it doesn't use the parent distribution. It uses only the maximum uh, wind speed values happening from each sector. Then you had to divide it into sectors. Then each sector speed is used to calculate the corresponding sector response. And most recently, this has been slightly advanced to multi-sector method. That means uh, essentially combining all sectors with the probability of excellence from each one of these sectors, which is the most recent advancement in this particular method. And in, as a pros, it is very simple to explain, uh, which is a nice thing. This is not anything complicated to explain, but there are lots of uh, problems with this particular approach. First of all, the statistical independence of the data between sectors, because uh, you can read some of the papers, the, the, the others by itself is saying that you cannot go uh, very small sectors, because if you go very small sectors, then the storm can be uh, shared between the sectors. So the statistical independence cannot be assured. So that is one of the major issues. So because of that, you have to select a large sector. But when you select a large sector, then you have other problems. Because when you select a large sector, then it can be very conservative. Because your building response can be yeah. very uh, spiked in certain directions. Even though the other directions are very small, since you are supposed to be taking the maximum from that uh, particular sector, you'll be picking the peak right. to do the calculation, which is not good because if that is combined with the maximum speed, then you won't get any reduction whatsoever. You will go back to the non-directional response. So that is one of the biggest issues. And it can be sometimes non-conservative too, because like I said before, you need to properly renormalize your speed if you forget to renormalize your speed, then you won't be even hitting the right speed. So that is a problem. And the last problem is the challenges on getting quality extreme data. It is very difficult to get the quality data because in many cities, you won't get a quality extreme data. You will always get the parent data, but you don't get an extreme uh, quality data. So that is a, another big challenge with this particular method. The second method is a storm passage method. Here, uh, it's a bit uh, complex. Uh, in, in principle, it is very simple because you have non-dimensionalized data from the tunnel, like, uh, like in sector method, which I showed earlier. You have direct data from the airport. You have hourly meteorological records of wind speed and direction from the airport. Uh, what, why to convert that into an analytical form? without converting into an analytical form, you take the data, data and directly combine with your internal data. That means hour by hour, you can combine it. You can say that, okay, this hour, the wind speed is coming from 310 degree with a particular speed. Combine it with your internal data for that particular direction, right? And then the next hour, it is coming from 20 degree. Fine, 20 degree, you have a wind speed, you have direction, you know the internal response for 20 degree, combine it. Likewise, you can combine the data hour by hour for years. And then you have the total response of the building, right? And then you can pick the extremes out of this and you can go through an extreme value analysis and then you associate a risk 
corresponding to a particular response. Then you can say, okay, this is my 50 year moments at the base. So this is a direct method. Okay, this is a direct method where, is, where there is no assumptions whatsoever. This is the most direct one can do. Yeah. But here, there is a problem. The problem is that again, the availability of time series data mm. uh, means in many places we don't have that. So again, we have to make assumptions and things like that. Computationally very intensive, you can imagine, because you have so much of time series data from the airport and then hour by hour you are combining it and it, it will take time in, in the computer. And accuracy also depends on the accuracy of the meteorological data. One has to be very careful, like I said before, you had to first make sure the data is intact and data has no outliers, et cetera, and et cetera. So just imagine that process itself, how much you had to go through this data to confirm all of these things at the beginning let us say you have 50 years of data, hourly data, you just imagine the complexity right there. So you have lots of such uh, practical issues, but conceptually it is easy to understand, which you might have already understood already. So there is no problem, it's a direct method and it's easy to explain to others. The last one is a crossing method. Okay, this is highly mathematical. Let us see how uh, successful I'm going to be in explaining this. Uh, so this is based on, first of all, random vibration theory. Okay, those who have taken uh, random vibration as your course, or even signal processing. In signal processing, for sure, you'll study all these things. Uh, rate of crossing a level A by a stationary random process UT, which is published in 1944 by Rice from Texas uh, University. And uh, this is a very famous equation, uh, Na square root of two pi, epsilon u, sigma u, f u, a. And this is a very famous equation. Those who are following random vibration theory will understand. Join probability of ut and the derivative of ut following a normal distribution. You can write uh, equations for that as well. So in this case, that is one of the assumptions your joint probability of ut and derivative of ut follow normal distribution. There are certain, assu certain assumptions are there. And we picked up basically this, in fact, a UWO, uh, University of Western Ontario picked up this uh, long, long back. And they developed initially this and later on RWDI further advanced those methods, uh, make it, uh, I would say, a bit more elaborate and detailed. And I'll try to explain that method. For instance, you have an input here, you are doing a test, and this is a tap location. And you, when you do the test, you got a pressure coefficient. And the pressure coefficient is plotted in the middle. So you can see peak negative CP for that particular location. So when wind is coming at 100 degrees, you can see north, so at 100 degrees, you are going to get a high section at that location. That is why you get the highest uh, CP. And then other location, you have a lesser CP. This is section. Once you do this process, you have to convert this to velocity. Um, so what that means is, what is the uh, chance of, for instance here, one KPA, two KPA, and three KPA lines I'm plotting. So let us say, take uh, three KPA as my line, which is a red uh, dot line. For 100 degree, if I want to have three KPA at that particular location, then I can have a lesser speed. Why? Because my CP is very high for 100 degrees. Since, since my CP is very high at 100 degrees, I don't need a high velocity at 100 degrees to get me to three KPA at that location. I can have a lower velocity based on this equation. You look at this equation. CP peak into half rho V square. So when CP is higher, then my U bar need not be higher. It can be lower to get me three KP. Okay, so I put an example there. My three KPA to occur from north. You can see at north, if I want to have three KPA, my velocity should be 80 meter per second. But if three KPA to occur from 100 degrees, then my velocity should be only at 40 meter per second. 
40 meter per second will give me three uh, kPa from 100 degrees just because my CP is too high. Okay. But at north, I won't be getting that until otherwise I go into 80 meter per second. So now I converted my pressures to velocity. Now what I'm thinking is this is a uh, this is an artificial velocity, right? I'm thinking for these pressures to occur, what is the velocity should be blowing? Now the question is, in reality, what is the chance of these velocities are getting exceeded from the meteorological data? So you go into the next process. So you can see the distribution P, U bar, theta, U bar as well as theta. Then you can see these uh, 10 to the power of minus 10, those lines. So what that means is those are the exceedance limits. So each one of those uh, direction, uh, the velocity can be very different. Exceedance is at different directions. It is keep changing. Then I need to find out this three KPA where it is all getting exceeded for each direction. What is the overall exceedances from each one of those direction of my velocity response versus the actual meteorological data. I know that this is a, a, a bit uh, complicated. So I thought of uh, bringing another thing into picture, just a simple plot. For instance, here, my P U bar theta, uh, uh, the, uh, the probability distribution is written at a particular theta. And then for a particular pressure P, which is my three KPA, let us assume, I have a uh, velocity at which, beyond which there is an accident happening. So this particular U bar P could be 80 or 40 or whatever, that is my excedence of that particular pressure uh, beyond this particular velocity. So this tape, and then I had to sum this up from 10 degrees to 360 degrees to get the overall excedences from all angles, then take an inverse of that, that is going to be my return period. Basically, this is only the excedences because as you know, a uh, 50 return period means one by 50. So my excedence is two per shot. So I'm talking about here only the excedences at each angle of attack for a particular pressure. Then I add them up uh, throughout the sector. Then I get my total excedences. And then I take an inverse of that to get the return period. So those uh, equations, I mean, uh, this equation, uh, you can find out, I'll be showing uh, some of the references. You can go through that. So number of crossings and et cetera, uh, you have to first plot that versus the peak pressure then followed by peak pressure versus return period. You're taking an inverse of that uh, with, uh, with a particular equation. This is the rate per, this particular equation is a rate per hour. So you had to bring the hour in the picture in uh, while calculating this 8760 hours in a year. And then you can plot it. And out of this plot, you can pick the right uh, uh, return period versus the peak pressure. And similar procedure for moments as well. Okay, moments or shears, et cetera, everything follows the same procedure. Um, I'll show some examples here. Uh, this is a Hong Kong code development we have used uh, for uh, six typical buildings and we have used uh, 50,000 years of simulated data to do this uh, analysis. At that time, we utilized uh, different methods and non-directional, uh, always the most conservative, as you know, 100%. I mean, that cannot be more than 100%, like uh, what Girish was, uh, has spoke this uh, earlier. And then we have used sector method. We have used a crossing method as well as storm passage method, which is the most direct method. And uh, as you can see the crossing and storm passage, storm passage is the ultimate method, if you want to call it, because you are directly using the actual data. And you can see the crossing, how close they are with the storm passage method uh, in all of these buildings that uh, we, we have uh, done for Hong Kong. A similar exercise we have done at a lot of other locations, Seattle, uh, Miami area. We have used, you can see time history approach means direct mother versus subcrossing approach. This is a cladding pressure. And we plotted what we get out of the crossing approach versus the direct method. If everything falls onto the line, that means it's uh, uh, much closer to the direct method. 
if it is deviating, that means it is not closer to the direct method. So you can see a good comparison uh, between the two, which is again uh, giving confidence in terms of uh, this uh, of crossing method really representing the direct method. So in uh, procedures, I'm not going through the uh, in elaborate discussions, but you, you have to use a parent distribution, not extreme value distribution and where the data availability is very good and uh, speeds required to produce series of responses for each direction, then uh, probability of excedences for uh, those speeds for each direction, then return period associated with the particular response is the inverse of the some other probability of excedences from all directions. And the pros is, uh, it's a statistical fit to win climate data so one has some control in terms of even if you don't have the data in which way you can fit the data or you have less confidence in data, how do we do with the data? You have much more control. Anomalies in the wind climate data will be removed or smoothened before even we use the data. So there is a lot of such things happening. And I don't get into this particular detail. You can look at that later. And difficult to explain in layman's term, which I agree. Uh, but it is not that difficult if you uh, follow the random vibration theory, it's not that difficult. This formula is kind of simple. The only thing is the application part, you, one has to put it in a program because there's a rigorous uh, um, evaluation is required from all angles. You just imagine if you have thousand tabs on your building, how much uh, computation it has to go through for each location. So, uh, but if you do a uh, direct method, it will take, I think, much more than that because you are I dealing with uh, actual. I, I was about to ask you that. <laughs> uh, if direct method was, uh, you know, acceptable and it gives the uh, most reliable results, yes. Uh, why should we go to this analytical procedure? If we can do that. We have been using that at certain locations. Uh, for instance, mm. if uh, in states, I think, especially in cyclonic prone regions, regions, we have. A very good data because we are using Monte Carlo yes. simulation. That's right. You know? that, that's the answer. I mean, yeah, we, we yeah. may not have data at each location. Yeah, we at each location. So you can say that approaching is more like a worldwide approach. Wherever right. you want to go, you can do. But in a time domain as well as direct, in certain location, you can apply. Yeah. And we are, we are already doing that. Okay. okay. Uh, now uh, we are coming to the closure. So crossing method, I think we have applied onto the birds long back. And here, not only just the crossing approach, we have rotated the birds itself by a certain uh, angle, because initially the, the orientation was in such a way that the strongest wind is coming and hitting the birds from uh, the wings, between the wings. As you know, when it is coming between the wings, you can really push the structure. Because right. based on this uh, interesting shaping exercise, as you know, that you're not expecting any crosswind on birds. So in birds, you're expecting only a long wind loading in birds. So a long wind loading is going to be maximum when your dominant direction is between the wings. So we thought, okay, let us reorient this structure by about 35 to 40 degrees so that the dominant winds are hitting the wings, not between the wings, it is hitting the nose. So when you hit, when you when the dominant wind hit the nose, then it shears off because of the aerodynamics. So in that way, we could able to reduce the uh, loading. I would say significantly of the order of fifteen percent or so. We reduced it, right. and over and above, we applied a crossing method uh, to further reduce it mm. because the dominant winds in uh, in Dubai it is from uh, 280 to 90 degrees. That is where the nose is pointed, you know. So it added not only just the aerodynamics, but also the crossing helped in reducing the response even further. So finally, the concluding remarks. Uh, wind direction is an important part of the puzzle in arriving at design loads and acceleration. I just uh, uh, brushed it uh, through this uh, uh, webinar, but you can think later, I mean, how important it is. I think my earlier slides initially showing between Mumbai and Hyderabad will explain how important those are. Actually.
know, how much you can reduce the load. Simplified provisions in uh, standards. I would call it blanket factors because especially the ones in uh, uh, can, uh, Indian code as well as in uh, uh, American code, those are blanket factors because just one number, regardless of the location. And But I think the Australians did a much better job because they have fine-tuned that and they have different numbers for different, uh, different locations, which is good. I think one can do that depending on the size of your country between the locations. So that is the question mark. However, robust mathematical methods can be used to fully capitalize on the extent of the wind climate data. Okay, you can get the data from the airport and you can properly use it. And uh, there, I think an expert hand is required because you should be very aware of the challenges posed by the wind climate data. Many times the data itself is having problems. So mm -hmm. an expert hand is required, not like, you know, you just get the data and look at, oh, this, this is from where the wind direction is coming from. You wouldn't be able to do that. I, I think I would call it a meteorologist is, should be involved in figuring out these things. Right. Only a meteorologist can understand because he'll be not looking at just the wind speed and direction. He'll be looking at pressure. He'll be looking at relative humidity. He'll be looking at temperature. He'll be looking at, you know, whether these things are correlated with each other, why the storm is happening this way or that way. And those kind of analysis is really required. And I believe that uh, we built uh, such uh, uh, expert hands in house, uh, at least in RWDI. And we have meteorologists working behind these in order to figure these out. And they have uh, much more uh, good control on, uh, over the data. And then after you have the good control, you have to also think about the uncertainty of the data. So you may have to do data rotation because you can't believe the data 100% that you have to do certain other modification. You may have to do some cutoffs. You cannot go to, when the wind velocity is 44, you don't want to go to 25 to do some analysis. So you have to be extremely careful. That's what I'm saying. Uh, this is an area where a structural engineer or a developer won't be able to handle this. This has to be handled by a, an expert, a, a wind consultant who, a, a meteorologist come in consultant will be the adequate person to be taking care of this. Uh, we shall be using a robust and seasoned method for integrating wind climate uh, data. Of course, the intent is to provide optimized uh, responses uh, but without losing quality in the processing stage. We should not be just in a race to optimization. Okay, we have to have give proper importance to the processing and we should not lose quality. And a processing method is a robust method available in the industry for wider applications around the world, regardless of the climate region, whether it is a thunderstorm region, cyclonic region, or any other type of interesting climate, uh, so many different types of storms and etc. Uh, this has proven uh, that its ability applied to thousands of buildings and structures worldwide for the last several decades. It is not just one decade. I think we started using this from 1980s onwards or something. And including uh, 16 out of the 20 world's current tallest building has been uh, designed. I mean, uh, analyzed based on this particular approach. Lastly, uh, the approaching method is referenced and approved in many codes of practice and standards. And uh, you can refer these ones later and you'll be seeing this particular webinar video again so that you can write down these. Uh, these are CDBH guidelines, uh, which has already quoted this. AC pre-standard perform-based wind design is already quoting this. AC, uh, other AC uh, uh, documents, and uh, as well as Australian documents are also quoting this particular method. And if you want to know more about it, you want to get into the real uh, details in terms of equations, then I would uh, refer you to these two papers, uh, which is also explaining a lot of things about the variation between the methods and et cetera. Those who are doing research definitely should look at these papers.
Uh, that's about it. It's a bit uh, heavy topic, but uh, I hope I, I try to explain it in a layman's term. And uh, if I uh, hopefully I'm succeeded at least in a certain percentage. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I think very nice presentation. Girish, I will just take a minute yeah. just to make uh, two announcements. Uh, I think many uh, attendees are asking about the presentation. I think we would like to upload this PDF file. I think Dr. Suresh Kumar uh, will be sharing that PDF file, which I think we can share with the participants. Is it okay, Dr. Suresh Kumar? Uh, this will be put in a LinkedIn for sure. LinkedIn, okay. Uh, so whatever LinkedIn it is. So yes. People can LinkedIn. reference it, of yeah. course, later on also. For more understanding, and I, I hope, yes. I think more detailed elaboration and write-up, I think, will be required for yes. understanding the procedure. So I request Dr. Suresh Kumar to give us a write-up on this, I think, crosswind techniques and this yes. upcrossing method. What he is trying to explain with a small example, yes. as rightly has shown the Mumbai and Hyderabad the examples also. And yes. one more small question, which is I think asked by some of the participants, that the diagrams you shown for Mumbai and Hyderabad, the wind load diagrams that yes. they created for a 50-year return period. So yes. how those diagrams are constructed and where these diagrams will be available? That is a question asked by some <laughs> participants. So can you please explain that, how it is worked out and how it is plotted, where you get those information? Uh, this information, basically, we get the data from the airport. Uh, for Hyderabad, we got the data from Hyderabad airport. Uh, for Hyderabad, probably 30 to 40 years of data, we already have it. And so we analyze the data because you can put these data into bins, right? <laughs> Because every uh, hour, what is coming up, coming in Hyderabad is coming okay. from a particular direction. So you mm -hmm. categorize this wind velocity versus the wind direction as a table, two-dimensional table. Mm -hmm. So you know how many times the wind speed is between 5 to 15 meters per second, coming from 10 to 20 uh, degrees. Likewise, you give a frequency diagram. It's a frequency diagram of the wind speed versus wind direction. You can plot a two, two directional probability distribution. One of the axes is wind speed, the other axis is uh, wind direction. And from that, you can derive uh, this particular so for, stuff. Yeah, how many years of data is required to create this? This is about 30 to 40 years of data. This uh, particular data, which I showed, uh, didn't have any simulated data, no simulated data for Hyderabad as well as Mumbai. We didn't use any simulated data. This is actual measurements from the airport. I see. So the data is very important for so many long data, years. Yes, yes. You, you know, can get the data it. from IMD or mm -hmm. even NCDC. There are different platforms. One can purchase the data. The data getting from India uh, is kind of difficult too sometimes uh, for what purpose and all of those things. Uh, but once you get the data, the real trouble starts to understand. Because uh, da getting data is fine, but like I said, there is lots of complications in terms of anemometer height, what is the surroundings, how much right. correction you, has to, you have to make it, is believable or, not, be believable or not, those kind of questions. So for that, uh, you had to purchase not only just the speed data uh, and wind direction data, you had to also purchase uh, pressures related to humidity, temperature, et cetera, and et cetera. And then you have to have a, a total analysis, basically, of the climate which is happening in Hyderabad in order to come up with the meaningful uh, diagrams. So, uh, as a corollary to the question asked by Hemant, I have a very, very uh, important question to ask you about the validity uh, yes. or accurateness of this data, which is available from airports. Yes. Airports are collecting this data primarily for takeoffs and landing, you know, of air, mm -hmm. aircraft. And um, uh, this data is measured at the air, airport um, at almost a ground level. I mean, that is their purpose. Whereas we are talking of our buildings, you know, 200 meter and 300 meter tall, even 100 meter tall. Yes. So how do we relate this data available at airports to our purpose? Okay, good question. See, all data traditionally has been measured all the time at 10 meters. Yes. Uh, traditionally, throughout the world, 10 meters are sometimes less, sometimes a little bit higher. Uh, but uh, it has been uh, renormalized to 10 meter height. At 10 meter height in open terrain configuration, which can be uh, in India, Category 2, Australia, Cat 2, uh, or Exposure C, etc. Okay. 
but your question of how do we extrapolate this to higher heights i mean nowadays buildings are not even 200 meters it can be uh, we are talking about 800 and thousands and 600 and things like that so that type of extrapolation from the ground level to very high level and this particular extrapolation is uh, that particular knowledge is already available I mean, already available, depending on your terrain condition, this is the way the wind is going to be increasing on a particular profile. For instance, in, in a CAD 2 profile, this is the way it is supposed to be increasing. In CAD 3 profile, this is the way it is supposed to be increasing. Regardless of the country that you go, whether it is uh, States or India or Australia or wherever you go, this is the way wind is going to be acting in a normal uh, pressure system wind. In a right. normal pressure system. Hmm. But if the wind is different, for instance, if the wind is caused by cyclones, hmm. these profiles are going to change slightly. Hmm. Okay? In, in, a, in a cyclonic uh, situation, the profile is going to be more, uh, more um, uh, steeper, not steeper, it will come to full scale speed very fast. Hmm. It is more flatter, it is more flatter in comparison to a pressure system wind open profile. But that type of corrections one can do without any trouble. For okay. instance, for going from a monsoon profile to a cyclonic profile is much easier. Hmm. But you have some difficulty in certain storms. For instance, if you want to uh, aim for a thunderstorm, for instance, that will be complicated. Hmm. Because in thunderstorm, the profile can be very different. In thunderstorm, your peak jet velocity can come at 100 meters or 120 meters, or in Shamal winds in Dubai, it can come from at uh, 180 meters or 200 meters, right. peaked up at that velocity, at that height, and then it get decreased when you go up, you yeah. know, not increased. So those type of analysis need some attention. For instance, when we were doing projects in, uh, in Dubai, in Burj Khalifa, not only just Burj, many other projects, we looked at these things, how the profile is yeah. being changed what is the effect of that onto a building? In fact, we even simulated such profile in the winter, but not in terms of mm -hmm. turbulent scales, but in terms of mean profile. One can easily okay. simulate such a jet profile by putting a plate inside the tunnel and you can force the jet uh, downward so that you can get that profile. We did one project like that. But mm -hmm. all I can tell you is that these type of uh, profiles, for instance, the thunderstorm profiles, can have some impact in cladding pressures at very low levels in certain buildings, hmm. as well as your forces could be slightly higher in certain buildings, which is lower rather than for a higher building. Because in higher building, these profiles are decreasing when you go up. So when you're decreasing, as you know, in top building, your major moments are coming from the top one third, not at the bottom. And because of that, your thunderstorm profile may give you a lower load than a than a typical pressure system profile. Yeah. But we table out these issues in, in important projects. For instance, in, uh, in Burj Khalifa, we talked about this, and as well as in Kingdom Tower, in, uh, which is undergoing, we talked a lot about these things at the time of the project. Hmm. Oh, understood. Now, uh, Srinivas has asked um, exactly the question that uh, you summarized in the end yes. of your talk. He is asking, as explained by you in Mumbai, maximum wind will be at 210 degrees. Yeah. Then, why do we require to stimulate this model with the maximum wind speed in all directions in wind temperatures? So, what is what is the difference? How do you clarify? Oh, uh, that is see this. <laughs> Uh, wind, wind tunnel is not uh, wind tunnel is not simulating 44 meter per second at all. Right. Wind tunnel tests are always done at a much lower speed. Yes. It is done at 10 meter per second, 15 meter per second. It is because that that too we are doing at the mean only speeds. We don't look at three second gas speeds. Yeah. So you have to explain that scaling procedure once again. Yeah, the scaling procedure because we first of all the gustiness of the wind the complication of the gustiness, how the gust is interacting with the building and vice versa, how the building is interacting with another building, and all of those turbulence issues and et cetera, we want to measure directly out of the winter. Yeah. Right? Directly out of the winter. So in that process, 
we are looking at a mean speed at a particular height blowing in the winter all the time mean right uh, at a mean height uh, mean velocity flowing in the winter so typically that will be anywhere from 5 meter per second to 15 meter per second in the tunnel correct we are correct. blowing consistently correct. get all the issues with the local turbulence interaction with buildings and all kinds of other issues everything will sort it out right there because uh, in a theoretical way when you think about it you won't be able to even simulate the right speed in the tunnel anyways so you don't want to be spending absolutely uh, time so, so it's all analytical yeah. yes it's all yeah. analytical and once you come out of that yeah. you you don't even have the speed because you are converting mm. everything back to non dimensionalized form you Got say it. that okay whether you do this test in full scale or in the wind tunnel this is the pressure factors you are going to get this is the coefficient yeah. that you are going to get we are not talking about the actual value the actual value we will do it analytically at that time we will merge with the wind speed at that time if what shin was is saying we want to do it you can do it because you can have 210 degree response you can combine with 44 and east from the east you can combine with 25 from west you can combine with another velocity that is a possibility that is where yeah. this methodology comes into picture right what methodology right. you want to use that's right right so uh, so uh, that explains it and in fact it explains one more question that is asking about you know um, what happens in suburban areas uh, urban areas where there are Um, yes. obstructions all around the building you answered that also yes uh, uh, now majid our friend majid hashmi is asking yes. uh, again he wants to be confident that uh, uh, you as a wind consultant have data of not only mumbai and hyderabad but in other cities also okay that is a good <laughs> question that's a good question because the data availability uh, in india as far as wind directionality is concerned uh it is uh, scarce you you don't have much data okay and if you take uh, other than metros if you are looking at any other terrain i'm quite sure you may not have any data or so right uh, so if you want to pinpoint those locations and you want to get the data there is a possibility and that possibility is you take the data from nasa uh, upper atmospheric data you go through the warp modeling you simulate everything uh, wherever you want it to be and you can pinpoint the grid location and you can simulate it that's mm-hmm. exactly what happened in the gcc mapping which we have done recently for the gulf nations with the mapping exercise we used the measurement as well as the 30 years of simulated data so mm-hmm. the 30 years of simulated data added lots of value in coming up with the proper plots for the entire uh, gcc nation and that is what right. we should be doing because if you okay. because i know certain cases the project is coming and they realize that okay you don't have the data so some structural engineers uh, in fact it happened for a bridge where they say okay can't we put an anemometer and start measuring i said how many years <laughs> the, the project will yep. be over in 5 uh, years and we don't you yes, cannot sir. assess anything during that period so in such yeah. situation we can rely on the simulation yeah yeah that's right okay but fortunately you know india has uh, is coming up with a lot of uh, number of airports in even in yes. smaller uh, smaller cities so yes. probably they might have started uh, collecting this wind data as soon as right. the airport was built hopefully yes. in some yes. few years we will have uh, substantial data correct uh, there was one uh, very good question not question but an observation yes um, i forgot the name but it is about the bill yeah krishna prasad menon oh. he has made a very very nice observation about uh, orientation of bridge you oh. used to a wind petal and the orientation of bridge and you yes. said that the bridge could be relocated uh, reoriented not relocated reoriented but uh, not, i didn't say that okay go ahead you go ahead. no fine you didn't say it, but what he is saying is generally the bridge alignment is based on the terrain and most probably yes. the shortest distance between the abutments that is yes. that is seen you know yes and yes. so if we start rotating the bridge even slightly to uh, adjust to the wind direction the uh, bridge might become uneconomical <laughs> more yeah. because of uh, misalignment with the closest abutments 
than uh, designing it for wind. So yes. I think answer is very simple. We have to try all the, but but let us hear. No, from no. You. Okay. Yeah. So here my point is not the changing bridge alignment. That is perfectly correct. Yeah. I think people never wanted to change the bridge alignment uh, because you may have tunnels coming from both directions. There are lots of other issues because uh, certain issues happening because I know one of the projects we are doing right now, the bridge alignment is in such a way that you have two tunnels coming and in between you need to have the bridge. So you, you cannot change the yeah. bridge alignment at all actually. My point Absolutely here is not, not that. Yeah. My point here is if you have a very good data about that particular location and if you happen to have that data and you got this particular graph in terms of the wind directionality, all I'm trying to say is that you can reduce the speed as far as design is concerned. Hmm. Because here, the, the, the perpendicular direction to the bridge, your speed is much less in because your speed is coming at an oblique angle. Hmm. The dominant wind directions are at an oblique angle. So we can capitalize on this fact to reduce uh, for the design of the bridge, not only just the design. Yeah. In bridge, it is much more complicated because in bridge can be in unstable in yeah. instability issues. Yeah. So you have uh, flutter issues and et cetera. So you're looking at much higher return period. Yeah. So you're looking at 10,000 year return period. Your bridge is supposed to be passing such high speeds. So even if you get 10 or 20% reduction in your velocity, that is a big relief as mm. far as the bridge uh, passing is concerned. Mm. Not design is concerned, it's just passing is concerned. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise the bridge may not be able to pass the criteria. That's so right. I'm, Talking only in that aspect, not just changing the line. Right. Perfect. Okay. Going to uh, Hemal Modi's uh, observation. Uh, yes. See, he, he's asking, uh, in order to uh, get any benefit from directionality uh, yes. studies, one has to uh, conduct the wind tunnel test. Has, have there been any efforts on parts of various international core committees to incorporate the available wind tunnel data uh, so far and uh, come up with KD factors, uh, incorporate KD factors for different wind directions for particular cities. Has there any study being done by core committees? Okay. In India, probably no. Uh, but in Australia, yes, because you have already seen the uh, 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 the table and yeah. a few other countries also has such uh, uh, directionality plots. Right. Only very few, mm. because mainly the trouble is the data availability. So when uh, you have the data, uh, probably you may have to categorize because because you know the 39 meter per second zone in India, you have it at the north, you have it in the south, etc. So the the south 39 meter per second directionality is not going to match the 39 meter per second in the north. In, in places to places, it may be slightly different. But right. you can you can categorize, you know, you don't have to get into too much into detail, like 10 degree, 20 degree, like that. You can put it in larger sectors. You can have meaningful, right. uh, meaningful codified type of uh, tables, like, right. like the Australian ones, which I like it. So we can come up with that. The only thing is the data availability is the, the main issue. Perfect. We can do that. It is a Perfect. possibility. So in, in other words, if uh, let's say for uh, some place data is not available at all, yes. uh, we should forget uh, applying the KD factor. In uh, court. Yes. Yeah. In court. Uh, I would, I don't know, based on my experience, I think the KD factor of 0.9 will well serve on all occasions. Yeah, but um, one question has been asked by Rahul Jain. Suppose yes. we know in Mumbai that 210 degree, we know that is the uh, maximum in direction in which 44 yes. meter per second will will be uh, the speed sometime you know, in 50 yes. years. Yeah. So uh, in that direction, we should not apply the KD factor, correct? Because we know that is the dominant direction. Very good question. Very good question. But I have to say that the directionality factor is not going to be working that way. It is mm. it's a slightly complicated than that. Mm. Because the 220 degree 
alone cannot be the 44 meter per second. It could be slightly on either side. And, and what, what is the, how many times the wind is coming and hitting your building at 10 uh, degree angle of attack or 210 degree angle of attack for an hour, hmm. you know, for an hour. So those kind of approximations are already in the tunnel. Hmm. So because when you do the tunnel test, you're, you're not keep on rotating your disc. You are rotating your disc for 10 degree. You blow the wind for uh, whatever the seconds, 36 seconds or 120 seconds, which is equivalent to one hour or two hour in the full scale. And then you rotate another 20 degree. You're applying that and you rotate another 10, another 10 degree like that you're rotating, right? Right. This is more of a conservative way of doing things because no. wind is not going to come in full scale and hitting your structure all the time for one hour. One angle of attack. Correct. So there Correct. are much more than that involved in that. And that is the reason what I am saying if you are applying a crossing, it will look at all the excedences in all the angles, not just only one angle of attack. Right, and then right. because of that, you will always get some reduction. You will always yeah. get reduction. And I have seen cases, even if it matches okay. the dominant wind direction, you can still get 5% easily. You can get that is why. Right. Uh, I'm saying, and that is the reason also in AAC, you can see that the uh, Langer factor of 0.85, you know, regardless yeah. of the location. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think that also answers uh, Anis Becker's question about um, why we take uh, peak value in all the eight sectors. But I think this yes. yeah. answers that question. Okay, and... Um, Okay, I think we are covering. Hemant, do you have any question? Hemant? Hemant, do you have any question? Grish, uh, you have anything uh, that you want to ask? Everything clear? Or? I think uh, I'm clear. Yeah. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking of things that um, should be clear to the audience as well. Yes, go ahead. Uh, no, I think uh, regarding wind directionality, we have covered all questions. Okay. There are other questions uh, which are usual uh, for any wind tunnel seminar. Do you provide services for cladding and all that? Uh, of course, we do that. Yes, yes. I think uh, yeah. as far as services are con concerned, anything to do with wind sensitivity structure, any type of structure, you know, that is, I mean, yeah, yeah, we yeah. cover everything. Correct. Correct. Including yeah. rockets before launch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I have only one so request. I think, uh, that... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Girish, I have only yeah. one request for Dr. Suresh Kumar. Yes, you can give us a small write-up uh, in the form of some paper or five, five six pages. Yes, we'll definitely try to put it in our ISSE journal with an okay. example, of course, so that I think people will understand the technique in great okay. detail. And then okay. uh, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suresh, you have written so many papers, and yes. uh, those are uh, research papers, and quite. I mean, you showed the up up cross. Um, yeah, uh, the... that they, all that formulation. Yes. I mean, if you can write in very simple terms. And, uh, which we can understand. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And yes, yes. then I think ISSC will be very happy to publish that uh, for yes. the benefit of the viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So that's a request. That's a request. Yeah. There is, I think, Again, a couple of papers already I gave it in the literature, but those are probably a little bit heavy too. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. Those are very technical. Something very simple. Uh, I think that's what yeah. probably we should try. But but I think today your today's talk was uh, uh, helpful in understanding the concept of directionality, which yes. was uh, that understanding was not very clear from the code, the right. clause of the code in ISA 75. Right. So uh, there is just that you gave us, and yes. it was quite uh, important. Now now all we are asking is uh, explain the uh, four methods. Uh, yes, in a yes. lemon term, yeah. Correct. That will be great. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So over to Heman, you, Heman, now. Yeah, I think we are coming to the end of this uh, presentation. Very nice and fantastic presentation, Dr. Suresh Kumar, enlightening all our civil engineers and designers, especially.
on the wind directionality i think which was not much talked about a topic because we were only using that coefficient 0.9 and going ahead without design without understanding the background behind this factor i think you very nicely explained the concept and the formulations and mathematical procedures to do these computations i think that will give you better insight into our uh, structures and as i rightly i think pointed out by you the direction of the structure if it is possible to rotate the structure based on the wind uh, directions i think you can achieve some economy in your design forces definitely uh, for yes. wind loading especially for the high rise buildings i i think grief will yeah. agree with that because that is very sensitive to wind loading and that is governed mostly by the wind loads rather than your uh, seismic loads so i think yeah. that will play a very very important role in the design and optimizing really the design of the high rise structures and all so again yeah. uh, thank you dr suresh for a very nice talk i must thank, thank uh, girish dravid for moderating the session and asking the uh, interesting questions uh, through the uh, panel and i again thank all our icc team members for uh, helping us to arrange this type of webinars and all the attendees and my fellow civil engineers uh, who has attended in large number and uh, we will make an announcement of our new uh, next webinar in the coming weeks and definitely uh, we will publish some paper based on this i think presentation in our next iss bulletin as and when we receive the details from dr suresh kumar so thank okay. you very much for yeah. attending this webinar and uh, wait for the next announcement thank, thank you. you thank you himan thank you grish thank thank you. thanks thank thanks you. everybody thank you all thanks yeah. thank you yeah. thanks bye yeah bye Okay bye